Hello, we're beginning the book of Titus today. We feel like the pastoral epistles is probably 1 Timothy written very closely to Titus. Now, which comes first, we don't know, but they're very similar, and it's obvious they were done close together, with 2 Timothy done somewhat later. Now, remember I've told you, I think it's after the fourth missionary journey of Paul. I think he was imprisoned in Rome in the early 60s. I think he was released and uh, rearrested and killed sometime before A.D. 68 when Nero uh, was killed. So, I think it's a fourth missionary journey. Paul being in Crete is not mentioned in Acts except one time, just passing through, no chance to fulfill what Titus tells us about. And so I think there was a, a fourth journey. I really think Paul may have gone to Spain and uh, Gale, uh, Gaul. There's a reference to it in Second Timothy, I think. So. Here we have another one of the pastorials, and I want to say to you, two of the commentaries I've really enjoyed using in the pastoral epistles, I always like this set. It's a study guide commentary from Zondervan. This particular author, uh, Blaylock, is a very good writer. I think you'll enjoy him. The set that I always recommend is the Tyndale New Testament series. The Old Testament series is also excellent. And this particular one was done by Donald Guthrie, and I think you'll like that. Now let's go to Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, and of course, in, it meant little. Some think it was his statue. Other thinks it was the fact that he felt himself the least of the saints because he persecuted the church. A slave of God. And this is an Old Testament title used nowhere else in all of Paul's writings. It, it basically is an honorific title going back to Moses and Joshua and David and Samuel. Or it's the contradistinction from Jesus as Lord and Paul as doulos, and I'm not sure which one of those it is, household slave. An apostle. Now, the word apostello, Jesus says, the Father sent me, so send I you. That's the verb. It meant someone sent as an official representative. An ambassador would be a good way to translate an apostle. Of Jesus Christ to stimulate faith in God's chosen people. Now, the word to stimulate is the word kata, some think that it means according to the faith of God's people. Others think it means for God's people, but probably in accordance with the faith of God's people is best. Notice it mentions God's chosen people or the elect. Now, there are two uh, aspects of this. If Paul's in an Old Testament scene, which he, I think he is because of the title slave of God or servant of God, then possibly this refers to the ideal of service. In the Old Testament, election was primarily not for spiritual salvation, but for service, because uh, Cyrus is even used by the word Messiah, and God uses many people, chooses many nations that aren't even his to serve him. So primarily it's service. Now in the New Testament, the term takes on the idea of spiritual, eternal uh, salvation. You might want to see Romans 8, 29 and 30. You might want to see... Uh, Ephesians 1, 4, and 11, and I certainly love the doctrine of predestination. Here, though, it seems to be the Old Testament ideal of service, uh, call to service, to lead them on to a full knowledge of religious truth. Now, the reason this is so important is the pastorals are strewn with the problem of false teachers. Even at Crete, there's going to be this same problem. It's the word epigonosco, which means full and complete experiential knowledge, and this was to say that Christians already have that knowledge. They don't need to be going after some esoteric teacher or doctrines. They already have all that is when they have Jesus Christ, okay? Now, it says, in hope of eternal life. Now, in the New Testament, hope never means if possibly could be. Hope is a word of certainty with an ambiguous time element, and we need to see that. It's not, I hope I get eternal life. It's, I'm going to get eternal life because I'm in Jesus Christ. I just don't know exactly how. I don't know exactly when, and that's the idea here. Um, which God, who never lies, has promised ages ago. Now, I want to tell you this, God who never lies, you might want to see Romans 3, 4. Everything in the Christian life is based on the trustworthiness of God. He has made us some promises because of who he is in his name, and he's going to fulfill those. If we can't trust that, there's really no hope at all. Now, notice where it says, uh, promised ages ago. Now, this same truth, I'm going to turn back. I wrote this down another page. <laughs> um, it's really etern ages past. 
It reminds me of a little phrase, before the foundation of the earth. God did some things from us before the foundation of the earth. I want to give you a list real quick, and you see some of the things that God did and promised even before the world was created. Now we'll see Matthew 25, 34, John 17, 24, 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20, Ephesians 1, 4, and Revelation 13, 8. God did some tremendous things before the world was ever created. And we can trust him because every one of them has come true in its own time. But at the proper time, now what does that mean? Well, at the fullness of time, there are several things involved, I think. You might want to see Galatians 4, 4 and 1 Timothy 2, 6 with the same phrase mentioned. I think the Greek language, I think the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, I think the world was expecting God to do something. The, the uh, Olympic religions were falling in disrepute, and the world was hungry for a personal relationship. That's why many of the mystery religions, Cybele and all of those, grew up. And so I think into that cultural context, God sent his son. Now, uh, made known his message through the message that I preach. Well, that's a little ambiguous. This made known as manifest or brought to light or the idea of clearly being revealed. Now, his message is the word logon, which from John 1, 1 is a title for Jesus. So I think it's a focus on the message about Christ that Paul proclaimed. And that seems to fit much better through here. Uh, with which I have been entrusted by a command of God our Savior. Now this word entrusted is very similar to the idea of deposit, which is used in First and Second Timothy so often to describe that precious truth that precious gospel of which Paul considered himself a trustee or steward, and it's been entrusted to him. You might want to see 1 Timothy 1.11 and Galatians 2.7. Now, this little phrase, God our Savior, is an extremely significant phrase, and I want to tell you why. It's used in the pastorals quite often for God the Father. You might want to see Titus 1.3, Titus 2.10, and Titus 3.4, where it's used in this book. But look down at verse, uh, the last of verse 4 where it says Christ our Savior. This same title, Savior, is every time it's used for God the Father, in the same context, it's used for God the Son. Chapter 1, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 3, verse 6. Every time God the Father is mentioned, God the Son is mentioned with the same title. And this is a common uh, New Testament author's way to affirm the full deity of Jesus Christ. God our Father, Jesus. I mean, God our Savior, Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, notice it says to Titus. Now, Titus was a Greek. Uh, Paul refused to circumcise him. He circumcised Timothy because Timothy was half Jewish. He refused to circumcise Titus. He's not mentioned in the book of Acts at all, which is so surprising because in 2 Corinthians, it's obvious that Paul sent him to that troubled church. In the book of Titus, it's obvious that Paul sent him to Crete. And the book of 2 Timothy, it's obvious that Paul sent him to Dalmatha. And so here we have him used as a faithful church leader by Paul. Uh, my genuine child, same words he used for Timothy. In our common faith, and there's a beautiful idea. It's not unclean in the sense of being uh, evil. It's the word unclean in the sense of being common to all. And you might want to see Acts 10, 9, uh, excuse me, I can't read my own writing. Uh, Acts 10, 9, and I don't know the other one. I can't read it. <laughs> you might want to look up Acts 10, 9 and look at your reference Bible. Uh, notice it says, Be spiritual blessings, grace and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. Somebody said, this is a very formal introduction. Remember that the pastorals, though personal letters, were written to churches to be read publicly, as all of Paul's letters were. And by this time, very late in Paul's life, I believe Paul recognized that his writings were being collected and disseminated for the instructions of all Christian congregations by this time. Now, verse 5, I left you in Crete. Now, Crete is the largest island in the Mediterranean. It is the home of the uh, Philistines. And earlier, it was the home of the Greek Minoan civilization. They were very proud of their culture there. For this express purpose, two things he sent him for, to set in order things that are lacking and to appoint elders. Now, it's interesting to me. First of all, all the commentaries I read, it, it was obvious when reading this what denominational background the people who wrote it came from. You see, in 2 Timothy, Timothy seems to encourage the church to elect elders. But in Titus, a very new area, Titus is to appoint elders himself. Now, by reading different commentators, some say, well, Titus appointed. And that's all of those who are Episcopals or Roman Catholics, the ideal of bishops. And all of those who are Presbyterian are used uh, 
the idea of a laity and clergy kind of board, they say, well, Titus led the local uh, leaders to choose. And those of us who are congregational in polity say, well, Titus led the church to vote. Well, do you see that the bias is there? I think Second uh, Timothy led the church to vote in 1 Timothy 3, and Titus simply appointed in a new area. Now, the word elders, and notice the word pastors down in verse 7. Y your translations may differ. The first one is the word uh, elder, or we get the, the word episkopos from it, okay? Excuse me, presbyteros, I'm sorry, presbyteros, elder, presbyteros. And then a little later down in verse 7, my translation has pastor, but it's probably overseer or bishop, and that's the word uh, episkopos. Now, the question's always been, how many offices are there in the early church? Well, because of Acts 20, 17 and 28, and because of these two words here used in Titus 1, 5 and 7, I think that elder and bishop and overseer and pastor are all one office. So from Philippians 1, 1, we say there are two offices in the church, pastor and deacon. And the pastor would include elders and overseers. Okay, you might want to check that out. Now, in each town, as I directed you, aorist middle imperative, Titus is following Paul's command and is a representative of Paul's authority. Each elder must be above reproach. Now look at that in verse uh, 7, the same thing is mentioned, above reproach. This is the common theme of the pastoral epistles as far as leadership. It's used in 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, verse 7, verse 10. It's used in 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, verse 14. 1 Timothy 6, 1 for the widow's role. At the leadership of the church must have no handle for criticism either from the believing community or for the unbelieving community, and that's why this list follows. I'm not saying that some people aren't godly. I'm just saying if there's a handle for criticism, like divorce, like unruly godless children, like a poor family life, that would disqualify a man from being a church leader. And the same thing with this qualo, uh, a person being on the widow's roll, or I think was a deaconess. Now, I think that is, we're not saying someone's spiritually inferior or that one sin's more important than other sins. We're not saying that at all. We're simply saying we've got to be careful about leadership has no handle for criticism. Now, this same list is included except for an intensified form of both that the children must be uh, obedient and down in verse 8 must be upright and pure life, emphasizing holy and just living. It's exactly the same as 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we've gone over that and I will not do that again. Uh, notice the man in verse 9 must continue to cling to the trustworthy message. There's a play on the word faith. Basically, the word faith means faithful or trustworthy. I hope you'll send from my tape called Faith, What Is It? where I go into the Old Testament background that I think many of us have lost because of our cultural definitions of the word faith. Notice where it says, um, message that he was taught. And I want to say to you that none of us need to be innovators of the gospel. We need to be faithful links in the historical chain of New Testament apostolic truth. We don't need to be known in history for our great intellect. We don't need to be known for our great variety. We need to be known for our faithfulness to the ancient historical message. I heard a preacher once say, if it's new, it's not for you. That's a pretty good word. Now, let me continue in this verse where it says, he may be competent to encourage others with wholesome teachings and to convict those who oppose him. The leadership must have time to first learn the truth, be in the scriptures, be in the oral tradition, learn the apostolic truth. For us, it'd be time to know our Bibles. And then we are have to have a preparation of our character so that in love and genuineness and truthfulness, we can both reprove, correct, exhort. And all of those are important. We need to reprove those who are false teachers. We need to encourage and teach those who are weak. And that's the idea here. Now, verse 10. For there are many insubordinate people. This in Greek means not under authority. Now, this, of course, refers to the false teachers. Uh, they seem to be Jewish, and we'll get to that from the context here. Jewishness mixed with Greek philosophy. Same kind of thing as First and Second Timothy. Uh, somewhat that of First John, somewhat that of Galatians. So there seem to be several different kinds of false teachers. The question has always been, are they true believers who have gotten away? It seems from Paul's emphasis here, we have two groups. We have the false teachers who have a pretext of religion, a pretext of knowledge, but are not truly redeemed. And those weak, new Christians who've been sucked into that group that are just ignorant, but truly saved. Now, that, that seems to be, though I certainly can't be dogmatic about it. Mere talkers with nothing to say, but deceivers of their own minds. They know some, they have some life, they know some truth 
They've twisted it for their own, get, own end, especially those of the circumcision party. We call those Judaizers. Uh, Acts 15 reflects the Jerusalem Council where this deal, you've got to be a Jew before you can be a Christian, uh, is first discussed. The book of Galatians deals with the same problem of the Judaizers. Now, let me give you a few references. Acts 11, 2 and following, Acts 15. Galatians 2, 12 and following, and 1 Timothy 4, 3, where another Jewish element seems to be there about abstaining from certain foods. The, the Judaizers and the Gnostics had this in common. They both tended to be legalists. They both emphasize asceticism. The more things you don't do, the holier you are, was kind of the, the, the guide of their lives. Now, whose mouths must be stopped. It's a present infinitive, and the word here means to be gagged, to be muzzled, uh, something like that. Do not let them speak, is what he's saying. Uh, for they upset whole families by, their, by teaching things they ought to think. For the sake of dishonest gain. There's the motive of these false teachers. Exactly the same motive mentioned in 1 Timothy 1, 6. These guys had that enough Greek background to say, when I teach, you ought to pay. And so they were really looking to, for a lot of gain monetarily from their teaching, not simply the salvation of people, as was Paul's basic motive. Now, verse 12. One of them, a prophet of your own countrymen, has said. Now, this seems to refer to a 6th century B.C. Cretan philosopher poet named, uh, uh, I think it's Epimedes, E-P-I-M-E-N-I-D-E-S. And he wrote several things. He was very famous. A lot of legends had grown about him. But he said this of his own people. Listen to this. Cretans are always liars, wicked brutes, lazy bellies. Ha! What a compliment, huh? And Paul says, being so tactful, and he, that's true. Now, many think this guy is one who brought to Athens the unknown God, or at least encouraged it being put there. And there would be a tie there that, that, that's interesting. Now, always liars. The word to cretinize, to Corinthianize, meant loose, immoral living. To, be, to cretinize meant to be a liar. Now, here's what the lie was. They said that the grave of Zeus was on Crete. <laughs> Everybody knew that wasn't true. They didn't believe that. First of all, Zeus wasn't supposed to die. And if he did, he wouldn't be buried on Crete. But the Cretans believed it, and they bragged about it. So they were known as, as, as liars throughout the known world. Now, um, this deal about wicked brutes, when they have no compassion, and lazy bellies, you might want to see Philippians 3.19, is in reference to their greed. They were very greedy. Not, not so much lazy, but wanting to get things with no effort. That's the idea. Now, verse 13. Now, this tendency is true. So continue to correct them severely. This means to cut off with a knife. It's a present middle imperative. It's the only time this strong word is used. It's a new church. They had a wild pagan background. They were basically obstinate people. And Paul said, now, Titus, do not let them get away with these characteristics. That's what he's saying. That they may be healthy in the faith. Uh, verse 14, by ceasing to give attention to Jewish myths. Now, here's that Jewish element again mixed with that Gnostic element. Jewish myths. You might want to see 1 Timothy 1, 4. What does that mean? Genealogies, food laws, circumcision, uh, pride in racial lineage. We don't know all that it meant. But obviously it was a, uh, a Jewish addition to the pure gospel. Now, and to the commands of them. And to, now, what is that? Commands of men. Well, these men were enthusiastic. These men were sincere. These men were logical. These men probably were physically and emotionally attractive. These men looked like they had it all together. They were forceful, dynamic personalities. But their teachings were not the teachings of God, but the teachings of men. Now, in earlier pastoral epistles, Paul said that it's uh, the teachings of demons. And so we recognize that we're controlled by one or two supernatural forces, the Holy Spirit or the evil one. And so these teachings of men would be things that are not true to spiritual reality. It reminds me of Isaiah 29, 13, about they come with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their religion is made up of things they learn from the oral traditions or traditions of men. And that's quoted uh, in Colossians 2, 22. You might want to see Mark 7, 7 and 8 for the same kind of truth. Uh, it may emphasize, because we're in a Jewish setting, the oral tradition, which was later codified as the Talmud. Now, notice where it says, who turn their backs on the truth, present, middle, participle. They themselves continue to turn away from the truth. It's, it's something they do. They are openly, knowingly rebellious, and we must remember that. Now, verse 15, 
to the pure, everything is pure. Now, this is a universal principle. It's repeated so out the New Testament. We need to get the balance between our freedom and our responsibility. I think the best text is probably Romans 14. I'm going to give you a series of passages. I hope you'll look them up. But this is so difficult to catch the balance. What we must understand is that in Christ, all things are pure. Now, that has to be limited. Uh, you can't ever steal. Uh, you can't ever kill. You can't ever commit adultery. Uh, that's what he's talking about. But he's saying the things of the earth, uh, the normal things of life, those are good and wholesome if you recognize God is the source and give thanks. But because of cultures, because of weak Christians, because of misunderstandings, sometimes our freedom has to be voluntarily self-limited for the love of Christ and the love of other people. For the sake of the gospel, we chain ourselves. Now, we can't do it as a group. We can't do it as a denomination. We must do it individually. But we must recognize we're doing it not because this is truth, but because we're free. But because of our culture, because of the witness of the gospel, we limit ourselves. Let me give you a few uh, verses, if I could, please, on this. It's so important. You might want to see Mark 7, 15 through 23, where Jesus talks about human tradition. You might want to see Luke 11, 41. All of Romans 14, please, please read that. Please read in conjunction with that 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, and then focusing in on that same truth, 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 33. All things are good, but not all things edify. I like Luther's statement. The Christian man is a free lord of all creation and subject to none. The Christian man is a servant of all and subject to all. Oh, there's a balance. It's true. But remember these ascetics, Paul had to hit freedom. Paul hit freedom in the book of Galatians because of the Judaizers. Paul hit self-limiting rules in the, uh, the Cor Corinthian correspondence because of their abuse of freedom. One universal truth, free, responsible. And it has to be applied differently in different situations. If you're a rule-bound person, you need freedom, friend. If you're a loose liver bringing reproach on God's name, you need responsibility, brother. And I'm not always sure which it is. Now, notice where it says, but to the impure and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but their very minds and consciences are impure. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit, their natural uh, witness that is in Romans 2, 24 and 25, that all of us have a natural moral sense, gets perverted by the culture. It gets perverted by experience. It, it gets twisted and then you can't trust it. Evil minds corrupt everything. You say, well, I'll give you an example. Sex is a gift from God, but evil men pervert it. We've perverted every gift of God. Now, verse 16, they profess to know God. This may refer to a false profession of faith, or it simply may prefer to the idea they're Jewish, saying, well, we know God. We have the Old Testament. But by their actions, they disown him. Now we'll see Matthew 7, 1, Matthew 7, 16 and 20. By their fruits, you shall know them. Brothers, I want to tell you, and I want to say it so honestly. Our walk and our talk must both be godly. Deliver me from a man, being a church leader or simply a layman who claims to know Jesus, who, who acts so uh, pious on Sunday and lives a godless, self-centered life the rest of the time. Deliver me from that hypocrite. And our culture is permeated with them. It's why so many folks don't come to Christ. But I want to tell you what. By their fruit ye shall know them. The, the gospel focuses around three foci. Relationship, doctrine, Christ-like living. And you can't take any one of them out. Any one of them has gone. The whole thing falls apart. They are detestable. This is the word smelly. <laughs> disobedient and useless for any good. This really means they failed the test. It's the word for test with a view toward approval with the alpha primitive which negates it. You might want to see 2 Timothy 3, 8 where the same word is used. For two other places to bring light on this idea, you might want to see 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. The guy who is truly a Christian and built on the foundation of Jesus with wood, hay, and stubble in judgment day destroyed his whole works as far as uh, uh, rewards, but he himself was saved. There's a carnal Christian, one of the classical examples. Now, you might want to see 2 Peter 1, 8 through 11 for the same idea. Sometimes true Christians can so pervert their lives and twist that their lives become no practical use for God. Even the opposite is true. Sometimes Christians are so evil and godless that they turn 
those who might want to be saved away from Jesus. Oh, we're going to answer for that. We are going to answer for that. And that's the ideal here. Well, this chapter, I hope, has been interesting to you. I think that the most significant thing is the phrase linking God and Christ, the idea about different polity structures in the New Testament where it gets so dogmatic, we get so denominational. All of them are there. All three polity structures are there. The idea about uh, Timothy, uh, pick those men who are godly men. Leadership need to be godly, moral, respectable men. That's just the way it ought to be. This whole idea about the false prophets. We need some wisdom on how to handle cult leaders, how to handle cult groups. We need to do it in love, but with the sharpness of the Word of God. Not argumentative, but the wooing of the Spirit. We don't need to win the argument. We need to win the people. There's all the difference in the world. And the, the truth here about that everything is pure, that's a central universal truth. We need to balance freedom and responsibility. And finally, the idea that a true Christian can ruin his life and ruin his witness. God help us. I've really enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.